thrilled to welcome you here today. I am thrilled to be joining you in hearing from our partners from around the world and the speakers today. We at Internews are so privileged to work with the dynamic and courageous civil society leaders across the globe who are on the front lines of the future of the internet. And today is about those leaders. Everyone in this room knows that the internet is not a luxury anymore. It's the backbone of all communications, of all information that we create, consume, and share. The internet is critical to realizing both our rights and the lifestyles that we hold so, so dear, expression, association, privacy, health, education, work, science, and culture. That's why for more than two decades, Internews has supported partners around the world to demand, build, and protect a safe, open, interoperable internet for all. And today that promise and potential of an internet depends on the work of local actors all over the world, on their ability to fight for their rights, on their ability to design technological solutions to keep connected to an uncensored internet, on their ability to guide communities and human rights defenders and journalists and civil society to stay safe online. Today we're gonna to examine the realities of this world that we're living in, where regrettably digital authoritarianism is on the rise. But we are fortunate to hear from the leaders who are helping change that, from Uganda, Cameroon, Nigeria, India, Chile, and Colombia, who are all going to illuminate the impact of digital authoritarianism, but more importantly, explain to us and share with us the technological and policy solutions they're bringing to fight it. I wanna thank each of our panelists in advance today for traveling so far and joining us. I wanna thank Google for generously hosting this entire event and the reception that follows. I wanna thank the US State Department for their generous support to this work over the years. And I wanna thank all of you for your time and your attention and your insights um, as part of this conversation. And I really am looking forward to the conversation we're gonna have. So let's get started. Our first panel is going to uh, introduce some of those first-hand accounting of what it feels like to live with digital authoritarianism and how to fight it. It's gonna be moderated by Mikio Young, Vice President of the National Security Program and Chairperson of the Cyber Enforcement Initiative at the global think tank, Third Wave. And importantly, Internews board member. Mika, you come in and uh, you'll introduce the panel. Thanks everyone. It doesn't, if I could have my panelists join me on stage, please. Hi everyone, I'm Mika Oyang. As Jeannie said, I'm um, the Vice President of the National Security Program at Third Way. Um, I will introduce our panelists. Most importantly here for the purposes of today, I, I'm a board member at Internews and um, I joined the board in November of 2016, which as you can imagine was a um, pivotal moment in Internews fight against authoritarianism on the internet. And I have to say that when I joined the board, it was one of the most inspiring things that I had ever done in the wake of the 2016 election was to learn about the work that Internews was doing around the world. And I'm very pleased to be here um, with some of Internews value partners globally. Um, and I will start here to my left with Gibenga Sesam. And I apologize if I get the name wrong as someone whose name is complicated to spell and pronounce. I, I'm always sensitive to that. Um, Gibenga is the executive director at the Paradigm Institute in Nigeria. Um, we have uh, next to him Maria Paz Canales, who is um, works a Chilean lawyer um, who joined us and flew in today, so we really appreciate that. And um, Mishi Chowdhury, who is the managing partner at a law firm and the legal director for the Software Freedom Law Center. And John Canfield, who is the director of the um, digital, sorry, the global technology strategy at Internews and works with a lot of our partners on these issues. Um, so let's start with sort of the kickoff question. I think in the United States, it's always a little difficult for us to sort of understand what authoritarianism really feels like because we live in a relatively free society where people say all kinds of things on the internet and we ha are really committed to freedom of the press. So I'd like each of our panelists to talk a little bit about the missions of their organization, but also give a few specific examples of how authoritarianism manifests in their work and how that feels um, in the countries in, they w in which they work. Yemenga, would you like to start? I don't have a choice, do I? <laughs> <laughs> All right, so uh, Paradigm Initiative started as uh, you know, a social enterprise that was just interested in training young people 
uh, on how to get to know more about the internet, about computers, and be able to improve their chances at you know, either getting a job or just getting a better life. Uh, but some, somewhere along the line, uh, we realize the importance of policy uh, because you can train as many young people as you want, but if the policy environment is wrong, then what you're just doing is just you know, raising a bunch of people who will get disappointed eventually. So we started working uh, in policy and now we're very focused on digital rights. Uh, and and that, that is built on the fact that we see across the countries we're working, you know, across the continent right now, we see a climate of fear uh, where people are focused on what would happen to me if I say X, Y, Z. Um, and, and so there's that climate of fear, not just journalists, not just uh, you know, opposition. And what we, what we see right now is if you as an individual, if you say something that you know, uh, a senior government official considers something they don't want to hear, uh, then literally you are opposition. Uh, you're questioning uh, the almighty institution, which, you know, uh, which, which is weird. Uh, but on the other side is we're looking at the opportunity to focus on the internet as a platform for innovation. It would interest you. All of the countries we work in have digital strategies. They want to build smart cities. They want broadband penetration to get to 60%. But at the same time, the new policies that have been introduced are literally like you're inviting someone who's very hungry to the, you know, to the dining table to come and eat, but then you poison the food. You know, and that's exactly you know, where, where we come in. There's that climate of fear but there's that opportunity for innovation, and we, we hope that we can steer the conversation and action you know, towards, I was gonna say towards the right, but that, <laughs> that would have uh, <laughs> certain uh, meanings in this room and in this country at this time. Uh, so I'll just say towards this direction. Yeah. Uh, so that's, that's uh, but, but what, what we see in terms of the expression uh, and the manifestation of, of you know, we've, I, I'm African. Authoritarianism and dictatorship is something that now when people talk about it elsewhere in the world, we look at it and say, oh, welcome to the club. Because, uh, I mean, I, I, was, I was born into a military dictatorship. Uh, I went to school and I literally uh, was introduced into student union activism because that was the only way. I mean, you, you either were a student who was serious and studying and didn't care about the future, or you were conscious about the fact that there's a military dictator that is deciding everything for you. So you were literally uh, born, for, born into activism. So I think it's, for us, it's, it's a continuation, and it's a translation of what we saw on the ground to a new platform, to the internet. We saw this all the time. When newspapers published articles, two things could happen. Uh, the government could seize copies of these newspapers before 6 a.m., or a benevolent dictator could buy all the copies of the newspapers. I mean, that was a nicer version of, you know, of control then. But now, it's, it's a new platform. Uh, that was when yesterday's news was published today. Now, the conversation is live. Uh, I see something I don't like. I can talk about it in a moment. I can share uh, digitally. It can get you know, viral and things like that. So we now see you know, uh, scenarios where we've moved from governments you know, trying to shut down the internet it's not very sexy to shut down anymore. So you can easily just throttle, you know, you can slow it down. Because no one would know the difference between the internet you're slowing down and the internet that people already call plug and play. Uh, you guys are used to plug and pay, you know, plug and play around here. You just go on www.something.com and you're browsing. But uh, we talk about plug and play, like you type www.whatever.com and you're praying, oh my God, let it connect very quickly. <laughs> and it starts buffering and things like that. So you, you can't tell the difference. There are new laws. And, and you know, and, and this is what we've seen. There's, there's a certain set of, you know, sophisticated, uh, you know, measures like new legislation that sound very great. You know, in some countries, in Tanzania, in Kenya, you've got introductions of laws that will help the country make more money. But guess what? It's not about the money that the country is going to make. It's about how to silence the new opposition, which are individuals who are conscious of what should be said and say them online. So interesting. Maria Paz, in Latin America, there's also, there's a history fairly recently of military dictatorships, but as the Latin American countries transition to democracy, how are you guys experiencing authoritarianism? What is changing for you? As uh, someone coming from Chile, that right now is going through a very difficult situation, I feel that this is 
at the same time, a very ins inspiring moment to, to talk about this topic. Um, the same that uh, Gevanga was uh, describing about Africa, uh, Latin America has uh, characterized by a past of dictatorship and authoritarianism. And we thought for a short period of time during the last uh, 15, 20 years that we were walking away from this uh, trend. But sadly, what we see right now is that authoritarianism came in very different flavors. So before, uh, it was like something that used to be uh, regarded at, at, as an issue of uh, how the world was divided and, and the political um, trends that were dominating the global discussion. And today we see that, again, we are being kind of caught in this um, ideologic uh, fight, but different from the past, it's not so easy to determine uh, from which side the authoritarianism is coming. Because currently in Latin America, we can see uh, authoritarianism coming from, from, from the right and from the left. And maybe the way in which the authoritarianism uh, manifests, uh, it could be different in terms of the, the local realities and, and the ideologies that are behind. But the consequences for the people are pretty much the same. And if we look like uh, deeper inside the, the causes of the, of the authoritarianism that we are seeing in, in our region, they're all very linked with uh, structural uh, issues of our, our region. Uh, structural inequalities, uh, structural deficiencies in the way in which democracies try to develop in, in, in the recent time. So what we, we can see from the um, digital perspective, not only from the internet, but from what the digital technologies can contribute uh, for make this better or make it uh, worse, depending on, on, on which side you look at and how you try to uh, implement these technologies, is that in many cases, uh, sadly, uh, these technologies have been developed in our region with a very good purpose but not uh, having a, a deep enough uh, understanding of how are the unintended consequences of the developing of these technologies. So, for example, in the case of surveillance technologies, there have been something that has been implemented intensively in the recent years. Um, many cases, uh, these surveillance technologies have been developed with, with very fair and, and, and good purposes, which are, uh, have a more digital, uh, sorry, more uh, safety, public safety, uh, or uh, improve the efficiency in which the, the state and the government can uh, provide better services to the citizens to uh, address these issues of inequality that I was talking before. But the reality is that when you live in this context that I was describing at the beginning, in which authoritarianism is uh, at the round of the corner, uh, the difficulty of implementing these technologies, even if you do it with very good intention at the beginning to address these real, very real issues, the problem is that you never know when these technologies can go in the hand of people that will use them not for the original purposes, but rather for controlling uh, uh, people that can uh, try to present different views or in general to develop social control and, and try to shut down opposition of when things are going uh, in, in an authoritarian way. So in general, uh, the activism that Derechos Digitales have conducted uh, since uh, it was born uh, almost 15 years ago, started also, as uh, Kevenga was mentioning, working in, in the public policy realm because we understood that uh, even in many cases, uh, the technology has been uh, welcome in our region with a lot of optimism. We thought since the very beginning that we need to apply a critical view in how and where and why these technologies are being implemented. And we are in a civil society organization in the position to try to 
uh, shed some light in which could possibly go wrong if the circumstances of our countries change. Because as I mentioned, many of these technologies have been deployed and, and, and implemented in the last year that were uh, in, in some say, uh, in some saying, like good years, because we were in a democratic uh, environment, and we thought we would keep it forever. And the recent uh, times in Chile, in Ecuador, in Brazil, just show that that's not the case. So what what we have learned as organization, and and what we are doing, supporting local groups uh, working in digital issues in in different countries across the region, is precisely to strengthen the mechanism to um, speak up about what could possibly go wrong with technology and how we should uh, build the implementation of technology that is well intended in a way that is resilient and it cannot be uh, misused after when we confront this authoritarianism uh, that we are seeing now. Of course, this is not a, 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 a full solution because as I mentioned before, this is all linked with structural problems. So another thing that we usually try to raise, it's precisely that in all the issues that we confront as digital rights activists, we shouldn't uh, lose sight that these are directly connected with the fight for other human rights. It's not, digital rights are not separate rights. It's only the way in which we fight for other, uh, for the realization of other human rights. And all the programs that we run as a digital rights activist should be very connected and should have an element of support for the traditional uh, uh, human rights uh, defense that uh, is still very necessary to confront some of this, this uh, uh, structural problem that I mentioned, that if they are not solved, uh, the authoritarianism, it will not go away, and definitely will not go away just because we are uh, savvier using technology. Thank you. So, Mishi, India is the largest democracy in the world and also plays a huge role in establishing technology standards and a place where a lot of these rights are fought. Um, tell us a little bit about the mi your mission and also how authoritarianism manifests there. Sure. So I, I, try, I read somewhere and I quote that person all the time. I don't know the person, so it's good to quote them. It's like India and America are watching the same reality TV show. India is just two seasons ahead. <laughs> and um, so thank you to Internews because they started paying attention to India much earlier than the others started paying attention, which is prior to 2016. Um, where all what we are t discussing today here was already happening. I have to say I am the founder of SFLC.in, an organization which is a legal services organization, uh, which um, is like the Electronic Frontier Foundation, which is where we got inspired from, started in 2009. I'm no longer the executive director, I serve on the board. Um, and they're New Delhi based, but they have offices in other places in India. Now, um, I think not just in India, but in other advanced societies, governments, courts, and uh, the public is now facing, or at least beginning to face their reckoning with the extraordinary difficulties which are posed by uh, presently existing social media companies, um, the like, of the one which we are sitting here. They're not social media, that party never started for them. Uh, but uh, other, place, other companies, platform companies, who are now changing the human civilization in a very fundamental way. These companies surveil our daily social behaviors of uh, read our mails, spy on our social interactions, and present edited news feeds and personalized advertising, keeping track of everything we read, do, et cetera. And the governments who have always liked the desire which is universal, the desire to control is universal, do not want to be left out in the party. India is a very attractive destination for a variety of reasons. Um, our population is now a big thing. Once you are shut out from China, India is a much bigger market not to be left out. It's the largest market for WhatsApp right now. Um, it is a very big market to be attractive to platform companies coming out of the US. But that also means that uh, the other actors in play, which is Indian companies, the government of India, 
also understands how that can be used to leverage things for themselves. This is a public event. I'm sure there are consequences of everything you say. And uh, I do come from the largest democracy. I do not know what authoritarianism is because I've never lived it. But this is different now because people who do live there uh, are watching a very different form of what can happen. Needless to say, this um, city and the country has uh, ceded and vacated the moral high ground they used to occupy, which gives encouragement to a lot of people in other countries to say, well, these people are never prepared. They used to say a lot about free speech expressions, blah, 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 democratic values. Look what's happening in their country. What prevents us from doing that? So first thing which is happening is co-opt the vocabulary. Say you believe in digital rights. Say you be believe in democracy, free speech and expression, and do something completely opposite. The institutions are going to be very well applauding whatever people do on the international stage. Look at what has World Bank done to really ruin the entire way digital identity is done by applauding something, by coming up with really questionable methodology about potential savings, what India's biometric identity system could do, and then advocating for it to be advocated it in, uh, to be exported to the rest of the world. So, so the first thing is, as I say, co-opt the vocabulary, say we are doing it all right. India says the right to access internet is a non-negotiable fundamental right. These are not my words, these are the words of the minister. Um, the Indian courts have said right to privacy is a fundamental right. Um, then federal circuit courts have said that right to access internet is a fundamental right. In 2019, India shut down internet 78 times already. 350 times we have shut the internet since 2012. This is data available um, at internetshutdowns.in, a project my organization started, for which now we have been asked to book under sedition laws of the country because we maintain data. And when you maintain data, then people read that data. People make their own conclusions about that data. And there is no official data, but we go to the ground and confirm that data with media reports, et cetera. Reporting is a problem. The second thing how you do it is that free speech and expression, unlike, uh, so there's free speech and expression and there's freedom of press. Unlike the First Amendment here, that's not how India's free speech, free freedom of press is not written in its constitution. So the press is subjected to the same kind of uh, limitations which exist on free speech and expression for the rest of the citizens in India. Now media can survive two ways in India. One, you can just uh, do the softball questions to the people in power, not ask any difficult questions, always, say pra pray, always sing praises, and to anybody who questions anything, you can always tell them, leave the country. And you don't, leave, you don't like the country. If you don't like it, just leave it. You're a non-resident person. You're blah, 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 or go to Pakistan or whatever. Or if you're in the other half of media who's going to ask difficult questions, then you should be ready to suffer from the enforcement directorate, from police investigations, from taxation investigations to stand. The third thing you do is people who run nonprofits, and this is a major problem for the funders. The funders are always insisting, assuming, that what used to be pre-2016 US, that kind of setup works everywhere. This is a problem mostly in the US and your Europe where everybody says you should be a nonprofit, you should be tax exempt, you should have all these things as history. Well, guess what? They take away all the permissions you need the laws which you need to be complying with. If you say anything, or even if you ask a question, you will not get the permission to bring any funding inside. And then you're left on your own. There's not going to be any support for this kind of work because you're bringing in cases to defend people. Somebody will say something on a Facebook page or a Twitter or stand-up comedians, a country which still has defama criminal defamation on its books. It has sedition laws and a stand-up comedian will say something, the next day there will be a police complaint about them. And it is happening every day. So if there are organizations who are going to put up lawyers, we lawyers are expensive, and if, you need, if you're going to need armies of lawyers to defend comedians, mo uh, movie stars, 
and just regular kids posting stuff on Facebook, Twitter, memes, anything, because um, it's going to be a problem for them. Um, and it's Kafkaesque trials are a real thing, and they happen every single day. And there is no real support for all of that. It's a smart way to really make it impossible for people to work as, on rights from the government. But if you're a corporation, then it's a very different, different mechanism. Um, Digital India is a real, a very commendable project of the government. It's amazing. But if Digital India means that we are going to use the tools of technology to make sure that everybody has a biometric identity, blessed by Mr. Gates and the World Bank, uh, and then connect every other database into a national intelligence grid, and then also ensure that human rights need to be defined in a little differently in the Indian context. These are just official statements, not my statements. Um, and perhaps we need to see how the laws work out. Then you're actually talking about a surveillance system which the world has continued to ignore. What is happening to Uyghurs in one part of China is coming to every other place. It's happening in various forms. Um, San Francisco may not like facial recognition, but everybody loves facial recognition software in India. It can help crime, it can help a variety of issues. It's an easy fix. Attorney General Barr's statement about encryption does not help any other country. In one of the cases, people who are in courts in India, they're going to cite all of this and say, well, look at what he has said. If it's good for him, why isn't it good for us? Well, math doesn't work differently for good and bad guys, but that's where we are today. So um, on that happy note. <laughs> well, I want to come back to a few things here, but first, John, Internews does work around the world, not just in the countries that it, where we've heard from today, but all over the place. How does the organization um, balance its work thinking about individuals and the protection of individuals in the face of authoritarianism and broader societal change? Could you talk a little bit about that? Sure. I mean, I think in the word, world, the words that might intersect people, uh, it depends. It depends on what you're looking at and what's happening and what are the trends. And I think one thing that is really starkly apparent from our other panelists this morning, or this afternoon now, uh, is that it's equally risky to ignore the local context as it is the global trends. Like every single point that we've heard about of uh, pulling out NGO registration, so making financial transfers, or just existence of an organization more difficult, to shutdowns, to you know, different approaches of censorship and throttling, and being able to throttle the internet and have it really fuzzy about, is this intentional or is this not? And that's a very difficult area to talk to. It's a very difficult area to prove. And all of these are, oh, well, they didn't you know, sign this form correctly. Therefore, we're going to take their registration. Oh, it's just network congestion. It's not censorship. These are really difficult places to push back on, but they're happening in so many of the different countries we look at um, in very different flavors, which is why the local context is absolutely important and cannot be ignored. But I think the global trends of seeing this in not only different countries, but all across the world in different regions, Latin America, Africa, but also Southeast Asia, also MENA, also former Soviet states, Eastern Europe, like the same different approaches with the same, as Maria pointed out, like the same impacts are happening. They just have different, you know, local flavors and local, like, defenses. Um, so that all being said, it, it dramatically depends. I like to loosely bucket things in, uh, are we looking at what is currently an open society uh, with rule of law, with democratic values or practices, how you will? Um, is it already a closed society where advocacy is incredibly risky, incredibly difficult? Or is it somewhere in between? Is it closing? Are trends looking negative? Are you having to worry about things a bit more? And where is that going in the future? Or is it opening? Um, did it just have a transformation in government and things are looking up, things are looking great? Um, in, opening, in, in open environments, obviously like protecting existing policies, strengthening them, building new policies that are rights protecting, um, that is the most valuable and overall the long game is to, to build that resilient policy framework in each country. Um, 
enclosed, you really have to worry about safety and security and working with people who understand the context, but also working with diaspora populations. Um, giving them the tools and the training and the abilities they need to support to do their work um, without putting them further at risk. Um, in closing, I think that's one of the very like high energy areas, if you will. Uh, it's both, you haven't lost the ability to do advocacy, you haven't lost the ability to push back against these things, and it's critical moments that where you can do that. But at the same time, you also, to be respectful of the coming reality, need to start looking at digital safety um, and physical safety, holistic safety all the way around. But how can you, before it becomes illegal to do X or Y and Z, uh, build those capacities, uh, ensure people have the ability to understand what internet shutdown looks like, how to circumvent it, how to get around it, or how to uh, sustain yourself throughout one, whether it's you know one day, one hour, 90 days, or ongoing. Um, Opening, I think, actually, though, is the most interesting space because a lot of people will rush in and say, hey, let's open up everything. You know, the sun is out. We can be completely public. We can be completely visible. We can start up all of our advocacy work. We can push for all this. It's, a, it's our open window. Um, and that can backfire. A lot of places we've seen open and then contract again um, with often very dire, like, real-world problems. So I think it's a very careful standpoint in those places of where is this going? How public are we willing to be? What is our risk tolerance in this area? What can we do? What, what should we not do? And how should we kind of approach that? Again, like all of these are deeply grounded in you have to be working local. You have to understand the context. You have to work with amazing partners like these to really understand what the heck is actually going on as opposed to what you're seeing, what are the public statements what are like, you know, random white dudes from DC saying about it versus what's actually going on in, on the ground. Yeah, um, I wanna come back to something that Nishi raised and, and John, I'll start with you on this. Um, you know, the US is a really important role model in the global conversation. And Internews has long been supported by the US government, but it feels like we are in a real moment of change in the way that the US is understood around the world. Um, and it, it's sort of bigger than just one man in his tweets, even if that man is the president, um, we're seeing, you know, we have traditionally seen tremendous support um, from in Congress and in other places for continuing to push for internet freedoms. John, can you talk a little bit about the ways in which Internews has seen the continuation of US leadership in this, in, in internet freedom and places like that, um, and sort of what that has meant for the organization, for an organization like yours that's doing work around the world? Yeah, I would say, it the the day to day and the the vision of the funders really has not shifted dramatically, um, and that's the value of where play, people like Internews and the other implementers in our space are also able to have those discussions here in D.C. and also help shape the direction and work with partners to find out the the most valuable path moving forward. So it like obviously there's massive sea changes at the political and visible level but I would say there's a lot of stability in terms of where the funding is coming from, who's providing it, who's signing off on it, and a kind of how it's being shaped. Um, so, Gibenga, Maria Paz, uh, talk a little bit about this tension, right, because we have at the one level is tremendous stability in the U.S. support and programming, but at the same time, this political context has changed a lot. How do you experience these sort of conflicting tides uh, on the ground? Okay, let me, let me take you a few years back uh, into a room in uh, the Internet Governance Forum. So typically what happens at the, you know, those global conversations is that uh, Russia and China are on the other side, the U.S. is on this side with a few other guys. And it's like everyone is pointing at China and Russia and saying, you're the bad guys, you do the bad things, you know. Uh, but this particular IGF, something interesting happened. Uh, we had a round table. The U.S. ambassador was on the table. And someone from Russia and China, you know, made a comment about Edward Snowden and said, if Snowden was not American, you would have offered him asylum. And, you know, that moment, people laughed. But for me, it was a shift. Mm -hmm. It was a shift because that became the bullet in many of our countries. Mm -hmm. 
That became what my minister in Nigeria, for example, used in his public statement and said, the US does it, the UK does it, so why are you saying it's wrong? And, and I think that, you know, you know, we've had conversations about this inside this room, outside this room, and things like that. That moral authority that the US had and it lost is a major, major loss to this work that we do. And I think that it is important, yes, there are institutions that are still working uh, towards that. It's important for us to have that conversation and say, listen, there are things that have been demonstrated, there are things that have been said that have not been helpful because they translate into excuses. Don't forget, the countries we work in, you know, uh, I'll give a very simple example of, of Tanzania. Uh, where you know everyone talks about Tanzania right now about now how you know the man uh, the president called aka bulldozer uh, as as literally uh, you know taking the country in the direction where Ethiopia used to be and now Ethiopia seems to be going you know the other way and many times you try to have that argument in Tanzania in Rwanda the pushback is that you know what we're doing this for the good of the people and human rights is a Western concept and that, that is a dangerous argument to have, especially when the examples you used to give about the West now becomes a more complex you know, uh, conversation. So I think that you know, we, need to, we need to face the reality that the moral high ground that was lost now provides a space where we can have really serious conversations about norms and standards. Mm -hmm. Not about, okay, this country is a standard, but this actions, this you know, norms, these principles are the standard and everyone should be held to them, should be held accountable based on those. Yeah, I think that these hard times that we are living now also provide us very good opportunity. Uh, and, and for me, uh, precisely in the case of this uh, kind of uh, disaligning between what uh, the the different uh, funders uh, coming from the US, either the philanthropy or the US government uh, support to the digital rights uh, movement around the world, could also take uh, this difficult time as an opportunity to reconnect with some of the fundamental issues that I was pointed out at the beginning. Like understand that um, digital rights need to be more connected with the structural issues around the world. And, and coming back to some of the fundamental discussion, not focusing uh, so much in technical tools, which are still useful and important, but connecting more to the underlying discussion of what uh, we want uh, those tools provide us uh, in, in terms of, 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 of the values that we think that are important, that at least in, in our case, I agree with what Menga was mentioning, it's like reaffirming the, uh, the validity of the uh, human right international standard. So avoid this like race to the bottom in terms to, to say that because it's that it's under question here at the local level, also should be uh, under question uh, at international level and allow this line of narrative that Venga was mentioning that some of the states around the world uh, that want to go in the authoritarian pay path, sorry, uh, they are like using this as an argument. If they are questioning, I am, I am allowed to question also. So I think that uh, for, for US uh, funders, either government or philanthropy, these are very big opportunity to go and support and work uh, in, in the issues related with digital technology, with internet freedom in connection with these values, with these fundamental values and traditional values that they have been supporting also in the past. But that in some moment, I have the feeling that the, the technical layer kind of disconnected as a totally separate conversation from, from those structural problems. I think that it, there is an urgent need to reconnect. And in that sense, I think that there is a second layer that is more uh, directed to the strategy and, with, uh, and how we do that. And I think that in that sense, we need to understand working in, in uh, public policy, sorry, in, in, in policy advocacy, as a more diverse uh, strategy that not only uh, it's uh, fighting against uh, bad public policies coming uh, 
directly from the government, but also to work more in other uh, uh, behind the scenes places in which our uh, important decisions are being made. Uh, the decision about how to fund the development of these technologies that later are used for authoritarian purposes, uh, like the uh, investment uh, development bank that Michi was mentioning about the the biometric implementation, uh, syst the system implementation, and all that kind of conversation also relate to the private sector, like with the uh, huge centralization of services that we have now, many of those decisions, uh, the best place in which they can be challenged, which also for me is public policy, is like through the assessment and the work together between civil society and private companies. And, and, and use the international uh, framework of human rights to support the values uh, that are relevant for civil society. It's increasingly a task that is uh, related to private companies that are the ones that have uh, centralized in the recent years the power related to the uh, internet and uh, to digital technologies. So I think that also it's, it's an opportunity to understand how the dynamic should uh, be the work in, in public policy uh, in, in from all the level, from the local level in each one of the country and uh, to the international uh, sphere. Uh, so Mishi, your, your comments about sort of the loss of US leadership in this space sort of spurred me to ask you, um, is there anyone out there that people hold up as a role model for digital freedom and in combating this? Or is this a place where people are just fighting to, sort of, as, as one of your great leaders said, be the change they want to see in the world? And, and people are just trying to embody that as opposed to having a, a role model in the space now that the US is a little uh, you know, all over the place. <laughs> oh. um. In terms of the country, I don't know about freedom or what, but there is a role model. China is a very good role model. They've done economically very, very well. They are getting into places where US has completely uh, left the ground vacant. And um, the market is, cut, cut, uh, is just totally close to a lot of platform companies. The jig seems to be up for platform companies here, but it's a charade. Every day we see something which is said by the companies, there's going to be a hearing day after tomorrow also. But uh, um, the Democratic candidates have been talking about a lot of these issues, and but all of that is lost in a way act, if actual action is going to happen or not. But when you contrast it with China, you don't have a disinformation information problem because information is already controlled in a very closed way. You have companies which are so much bigger, the success of whether it is an Alibaba or a ByteDance TikTok way, of which is just completely eating everybody else's lunch in terms of social media, or any other platform. Um, building of technologies, whether it is Huawei, or, um, is, is very attractive to every other country when they look at it. They have an actual negotiation power with the US. India talks about data localization, and then US reacts by saying something about trade, which is $6 billion. When Indians actually, the conversations in India were like, what is $6 billion? The data of 1.25 billion people, if it's only being monetized by Indian companies, is far more useful than this small little thing there. That's why the push for data localization has been happening. And as uh, Maria Paz said, is because the private sector itself plays very different <coughs> games. You speak to a company here, it's a very different, not only the tone and tenor, et cetera, but it's also a completely different legal argument which makes no sense whatsoever. But when you are in another country, in India, which I can talk about is, they still play the Lex Locai server game. There is a cloud act here. MLAT process is broken. It can be done in actual cases. So, but they continue to go, fight cases, say, oh my God, my servers are in California, I can't give you anything. And then they have, then they will take this thing, you're coming after free speech and expression. People like us are also torn at that time, well, I do like free speech and expression, but not the kind you are mentioning here. Facebook is today all for free speech and expression. Two days ago it was different. And once you're out of China and you cannot no longer run on Tiananmen Square, now, and speeches of uh, uh, political leaders are protected. 
So China looks very, very attractive to everybody right now. You can run your own economy, you can monetize the data of your people, you can have complete political control, you don't have the problem which US seems completely incapable of handling in their own democrat democratic system or in their institutions, is how, how the conversations are happening in that country. Saying, why would we not choose the very efficient authoritarianism in contrast to this democra democracy which US is telling us? I understand there's a lot of nuance. I'm not mm -hmm. saying that uh, democracy is only electoral democracy. There is institutions, and I know things are happening here. Hopefully these proceedings which are going on in your Congress will actually go somewhere. But, um, but that's where the leadership is going. Having said that, Europe does look very attractive, but the problem with Europe is only regulations. You can't beat something only with regulations and not any innovation. Europe has not produced one single company which they can say, hey, move away from the network effects from the success of these surveillance capitalism-based companies and come somewhere else. There isn't anything like that happening. We have not taught our people that self-hosting is a thing, that decentralization is a thing. We all did, I come from the open source movement, I love free and open source software without which neither this company nor any other company would be possible today, but that building blocks were used for centralization, for saying we are the people who can build these services, give to you at a cheaper price so that you can speak everything. Well, yeah, but then it becomes much more complex. So much more complex that I don't think any one, and one stakeholder can address that problem. And that's why it has to be a multi-pronged approach. It, there will be regulation. It, it's not just antitrust, it's privacy, it's surveillance, it's free speech and expression. It's also about private sector, it's about government. You can't keep government out. Um, Multi-stakeholderism became just a name for keeping governments out of everything. And for seven, eight years, we did the dancing around all the time, multi-stakeholderism. Nothing came out of it. We were at a place, I understand and I completely agree, when problems actually come to such a to such a crescendo, then there's also opportunity, and optimism is the only thing which will keep us all going. Um, so, but but the problems are complex, and the problems will not be solved by one government, one company, or um, or us, or or anybody else. It will be very different. Europe will do regulation because they're good at it and they have done it, and they are proving to be more effective, um, but that's not enough. We will have to have alternatives. You can't beat something with nothing, so that's where I think it is. Well, on that, from that point of view, I'm sort of curious, because right, India, China, the US, Europe are large enough that they can try and create paradigms around their particular points of view. But for other countries, if they don't have the market share, they may have to choose among those options. They're not, they may not be in a position to be able to define the world that the way that they want it. So I'm curious for countries in Africa, for countries in Latin America, how do, they, how do you understand the, the offers from the, big, from the big players here? How do you understand them as benefiting or hindering the work that you do to try and change the societies that you live in? What, what would you prefer and how do you understand, especially in this moment, what is the U.S. offer in this competition? I mean, so there's, there's what we consider useful. There's also what uh, the institutions that interface consider useful. And I think what you see, uh, I mean, as I speak, most, a lot of African presidents are on their way to Russia if they're not there already, uh, you know, for the Russian African summit, uh, the Sino-African summit, O's and all that. And I think that there's a huge disconnect between what government representatives you know, offer and get at these meetings and what we consider to be what is needed on the ground. Now, unfortunately, what the, the language that governments speak is laws, and the language that platforms and companies understand is also laws. So for example, if you talk about free speech on platforms, they would eventually have to refer to the local laws of countries. And, and wh where this becomes a problem is that we're now increasingly having a scenario where governments that have an agenda in many of the countries we work 
actually now have laws that sound like they're solving problems. Uh, you know, a very simple example. So, you know, the Tanzanian government, the Ugandan government, the Kenyan government says, okay, you know what? We'd like to get a lot more revenue. And one place to get revenue from is the internet. So we have all these new taxes. But ideally, you know that these taxes are not really to get revenue for the government. These taxes are actually to control and make sure that less and less people have access you know, online. I mean, in Tanzania, I mean, we were talking about that earlier. In Tanzania, you're supposed to pay $927 to get a blogger's license. I mean, how, in, how do you explain that? Uh, you know, uh, I'm not the biggest expert in Uganda here. I mean, uh, you know, Ashna is. Uh, but if a country introduces a new tax that makes you lose three million internet users in three months, then you clearly know that's an economic advantage. Uh, so th I think the challenge is there's a huge gap between the people who interface and make these laws, which is the governments that have access to many of these platforms and to all the conversations with other countries, including countries uh, that represent ideals that we aspire to, and the you know, organizations on the ground who are able to work, uh, which is why, of course, uh, the interest of many organizations is now to get involved in you know, policy making uh, and all those processes to make sure that we get as close as possible to, 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 you know, to the ideal. But reality right now is that the trend of, of laws that literally just, literally just justify the wrong things that are being done by governments. Uh, you're talking about the cybercrime laws in many countries, you're talking about the terrorism laws in many countries. They basically uh, you know, get towards you know, gagging people who have been pro become prominent voices. Many of us, uh, the Chinese are also very aggressive trying to get into Latin America. It was sort of, you must feel like you have many sort of options there or there's a competition for your attention. How do you, how do you understand that both from this, where the governments are going in Latin America, but also for the activists, how do they see this, this tension? Sure. I mean, as a region, uh, we are not uh, uh, a region that is a producer of technology. We historically have been consumers of technology. So in that sense, uh, we were very attractive uh, for, for the U.S.-based uh, companies that uh, implemented very successful their technologies in our region. And recently, China have uh, put <laughs> its size in, in our region also, and it has been very effective distributing even for free a lot of their technologies, and those technologies are arriving in our region with all the, the issues uh, of uh, a technology developed in an authoritarian uh, country in which uh, the design of the technology itself, it's built in some sense uh, for providing the capability of use that technology for surveillance purposes and for social control purposes. But the problem is that the line of speech for uh, digital rights activists is not so simple for saying that these technologies are not uh, good and should be received in the region because again, those technologies are offered framed in a narrative of like being able to solve a real urgent uh, problems that we have, uh, structural problems related with, uh, with violence, with, with public safety, with uh, uh, corruption and efficiency. So it's not really easy to overcome the narrative of a uh, techno-solutionism that is behind uh, the provision of this technology for free on top. And also because it's not so easy to build a narrative of a uh, distinction from what are the other technologies coming from, from, from the US or from the Western world. Because those have become uh, technologies of uh, capitalist surveillance, as Michi was describing before. So people start to question in my region what is the difference between being surveilled by a government or being surveillance by the private companies. So how you build this, this clear distinction, again, it comes to my previous point uh, of like, if uh, US-based companies or Western-based uh, companies of technology want to show what is the difference, it should be a, a bigger alignment with the uh, protection of human rights and how that build fundamentally in the design of the technology to so show that there is a different path of development, how those technologies can be exploded for, for really uh, improve the quality of, of the life of the people and, and not at the cost of them uh, giving up in their rights and how those technologies should be a tool for building uh, more resilient societies and more equal societies and uh, societies 
societies that are fundamentally committed with democracy in all their aspects, not only electionary democracy, as Mishi was pointed out. So I think that, that it, again, it's a problem right now, but it's also an opportunity. And, and if we want to frame a discourse that uh, it, it make really align between uh, these uh, more authoritarian technologies for saying and other technologies, uh, coming from other places of the world, there is an opportunity to work harder to really make how uh, different business models are possible. Um, I think maybe we have a few minutes for questions from the audience. Uh, I, I don't, I forgot to bring my smartwatch with me today, so. <laughs> okay, okay, good. So um, maybe if, I don't know if there's uh, someone, we'll just take questions from, from the audience. If they're And as we're getting yeah, to sorry. the questions, I think that both the opening that Benga mentioned earlier and your points are really critical because what is authoritarianism? It's centralization of power. And when you move that online, and like I don't want to talk about platitudes of erasing borders, but borders are much fuzzier online. What does it look like if China is the technology provider? What does it look like if a major centralized platform is technology provider? It's, it's those exact things that you're pushing up that's still high risk. And if we don't take this odd opportunity right now to build standards and expectations of what do we demand out of privacy from the tools that our governments and ourselves are using, then, then when is that ever going to happen? We have a question from the audience. Hi, Genevieve from the Public International One Policy Group. Um, I think one of the basic assumptions of working with us these times that, you know, a free and independent internet is sort of core to the good government and democracy, but within a digital and especially transitional justice space, it's increasingly difficult to ignore the fact that a lot of these tools have been abused to incite violence. Um, and it's really troubling that a lot of these internet providers, internet platforms are finding it very difficult to decide where to draw the line. When we're talking about an authoritarian internet, the dictator is not just the government, but also these platforms. So what are the responsibilities and where should the balance be struck between responsibility and free expression of information? Thank you. Uh, I'll let our panelists answer that, but it, you may also have examples of the ways in which the internet has been misused to incite violence, um, not necessarily by the government, but just um, in the ways that the platforms have been operating and how you think about solutions to that space? Uh, so I think this, this goes back to the point I was making earlier. We, we made a fundamental mistake when we had role models and sort of assumed that this institution of this country represents what we're looking for. Uh, now that that's been shattered, thankfully, we now have an opportunity to create you know, expectations based on norms and standards. And those don't only apply to countries. They also apply to companies uh, to say that if a certain expectation of freedom of expression is violated because a company's business model clashes with it, in that instance, that company is an enemy of progress. Uh, if it's a country, that country is an enemy of progress. And, and, and so it, it, it comes back to the the, you know, not, not just the community in terms of users, but in terms, and I don't want to use the word stakeholders again, because, uh, uh, you know, it takes you to multi-stakeholders, but, but the people who use, uh, and even those who don't use, have certain expectations, and these expectations, it would take a lot. And this is where I have fundamental trust in humanity. Um, and I know, you know, it's a very optimistic view to have uh, that, you know, we will, we will, you know, sort of self-correct and eventually go towards standards that we almost all agree on. But that's, that's the way it's gonna happen. There are people, there are institutions that will disagree, but there are certain, certain fundamentals that we all agree on. I'll give you a very simple example. Uh, you would never meet a freedom of expression activist that says that child pornography is okay. There are certain lines, and I don't want to use you know, the, the red line, uh, you know, it brings a different image, but there are certain lines that we need to arrive at and then we agree. Either it applies to a country or it applies to a company. Because, I mean, to be fair, there are platforms now that are way bigger than countries. And so I think at the end of the day, it comes back to this 
you know, that the, the model isn't exactly institutions or companies or nations, but the model is the ent you know, entire body of expectations, of norms, and of baselines that we all agree, or at least sort of subscribe to, that we can't exceed. And when we exceed, we can jointly voice out to say that this is wrong. Either it's a company or it's, it's, a, it's a country. Um, I just want to add on top of that, very related in the same line of uh, reasoning, that I will summary the idea in that uh, we are looking for <laughs> centralization of the standard and decentralization of the decision made based on those standards. So as Menga was mentioning, we already have like clear guidelines in, in the international framework of human rights uh, that has also some uh, regional uh, flavors because, for example, the way in which freedom of expression is interpreted uh, vary uh, in different regions of the world. For example, my region, Latin America, has particularly strong standards uh, in protection of, of freedom of expression uh, and, and, and uh, uh, um, outline uh, the previous censorship clearly, which is different from Europe and which is different from the First Amendment concept in the US. Uh, so there are like uh, some local flavors in the interpretation and the application of these principles, but the fundamental uh, ideas are uh, uh, present in the international human rights uh, standard, and, and increasingly we should agree that those uh, should go inside of the of the practices and and, and the policies of the companies that are op operating globally. And then, uh, in the application of this, uh, much more attention should be paid in, in the local context to understand how uh, we, we can effectively apply these uh, standards that are global in a sensitive way with the, with the local context. So I think that that, uh, that is why I will pick this uh, summary of like uh, centralization in terms of a standard, but decentralization in terms of application and, and, and understanding of how the harm can be produced at, at a local level. I'm, I'm very glad that other people are more optimistic than I am. Uh, it's like climate change. Greta Thunberg gets very, very angry, and, um, and she's right. She should be angry. But uh, planet will survive. Planet has had many other things. It's, uh, it's us who will not survive. And considering how we behave, we perhaps should not. But um, I, I do think there's so many problems on how uh, the entire digital ecosystem has become are much more ecosystem problems. Privacy is an ecosystem problem. It's not just me and you trying to save our privacy. There are so many other people who can get in and compromise mine or your problem. And there isn't any other business model which we have right now seen from the internet which has told us that there is a way to make money. It's only about surveillance and then selling it for particular purposes. That could be a commercial purpose, which is usually said, oh, this is just a very benign way of collecting information, selling it only for advertising, which is what you need. There is no other business model which really effectively works that we have seen so far. And there is a lot of attraction for the tools that have been built, and there is not enough alternative tools that are coming. We never taught everybody how they can build their own tech which might be a simple thing. Running a mail server is not a very difficult thing, but we never taught anybody. That's why we have all these email free services, which we are reliant on everyone. So we will suffer on all of that. And more often than not, we forget, as John said, because the borders are fuzzy, so many times I have had to explain to people that India's First Amendment are the reasonable restrictions on our free speech. The US First Amendment is a US First Amendment. It's not the same but they think that they're online, it must be their right as well. And it's the same thing. The machines, the companies are collecting behavior all the time. Whether you show umbrage and you're angry at something, you're happy at something, they love the behavior. You should just be on the platform and keep behaving. They're behavior collectors. They're going to have that all the time as the center of their business. And the rights are justiciable only against our governments. 
I cannot go and assert any right against any private platform and say, my right of free speech is violated. S good, this is my platform. I run it the way I like it, and they are right about it. They have become much bigger. They are, I don't know what people want to call them, public square or whatever, but that's the truth. That's the way laws are written. Laws are slow. Lawmakers don't have an idea. They're talking still about, can you fix my iPhone? And uh, uh, all those are realities. But the, and um, like both of them, I want to be an optimist because otherwise what is there to do until we die? We should <laughs> at least do something <laughs> while we are here. <laughs> so uh, I do think that we, we should believe a little bit more in ourselves, our collective powers. That demanding better products from the companies by the customers does work. We shouldn't just resign. I have nothing to hide. I've given up now. Everything is already with them. If that were the case, they were not advertise on all airports, all railway stations here about how great they're doing with privacy. When, when, when candidates are saying certain things, that is changing the conversations. When the consumers are demanding better things, that is changing the conversations. Our kids are much better equipped in handling these things than we are. Because their idea of privacy may be different, but at least they understand it better than we do. Where we've said, oh my god, this is too complicated, let somebody else do it. Someone I was speaking to said, oh, my little kids, have, if pictures are on Instagram, what is going to happen? What happens if uh, he wants a political career? And I'm like, the sensibilities after 20 years would be very different. Because when everybody's odd pictures are online, what are you going to do? So, uh, but demanding better products from the companies does work. GDPR was this thing, oh my God, G you, EU will never be able to get anywhere, it's going to destroy businesses, it will never be able to regulate. It is working to some extent. Maybe not the perfect way, but to some extent it is working. Everybody is now asking for an, an omnibus national privacy legislation here because CCPA kicks in, in on January 2020. So when we demand better products, they have to deliver. When our regulators and our representatives, elected or otherwise, um, are forced to demand better regulation, it does work. Calling everybody out on their hypocritical statements, it does work. Saying one thing and co-opting the language, which most of the chiefs of our countries have now perfected, including here, everywhere else, calling them out, although as tedious as it might, might sa may sound, but it does work. Because somebody's reading, somebody's asking for that. And not believing that these companies, these co this has all happened in a blink of an eye. 2007 is when iPhone was launched. We're only in 2019. This can change again. So I, I, I think um, my optimism lies more in um, collectivism, asking for the right thing, holding people accountable, and continuing to march forward. So march on the cell phone. So John, I, I think you know, we really struggle with this misinformation. I know Internews has done a lot. Um, to try and combat it, especially there are a lot of environments around the world where misinformation is often used um, to cause real harm to communities. Can you talk a little bit about the work that Internews has done to try and figure out how to combat that kind of misinformation? Uh, I mean, to some extent. We focus much more on, instead of saying combating or fighting or any of that, really just focusing on building strong existing information ecosystems, working with local independent media, uh, giving them the support they need. They already have built trust, they already are recognized, um, but their revenue streams are drying up. Their ability to be visible is drying up. And so how can we supplant that, support that, have them find other ways, uh, newer ways to survive in a very different, like broader information landscape? Um, and so that really is our approach, a bit more positive and optimistic, I guess than constantly worrying about how are we combating this specific type of misinformation. The, the longer game is really like not giving it fertile ground to take place in. So if you have a strong existing information system, that gives it a lot more resilience and protections around it. It's not perfect. Like misinformation is 
can be targeted and weaponized in very effective ways that defeats even very strong ways like that. But it's, it, it's the strongest, easiest, most uh, cleanest in a way. It doesn't get you in messy arguments. It's like oh, we're building this and it's right. strong and it's pretty, a, pretty clearly a good thing to build. And right, preserve really good information instead yeah. of fighting the dissemination of bad information. Oh, because you're then just fighting specific fires all the time. Can I add on top of that? I think that this is clearly one of the example of uh, that Mishi was referring as an ecosystem issue. So I think that, for example, in Latin America, we have seen that um, the conversation about misinformation uh, many times go to this idea of like uh, trying to find the true, when uh, true is something that always have been difficult to determine even before uh, the digital. Uh, development uh, of media. It was something that it was uh, struggling for also the traditional media. So at the end, as one of the issues related with the ecosystem, we should look at different places in which we can reinforce the ability of the ecosystem to determine what is, is misinformation. Rather than that, like focus as it was a, a problem that we will confront in one place, is something that it need to be addressed in, in, in the things that John was mentioning, like strengthening the ability of independent media to provide information and to have a, a means of surviving a, a, in this changing environment. It means that we need to look at, at, at uh, all the election uh, regulation that is in place in different countries to uh, ask for more accountability about how digital media is used for uh, uh, political purposes. It looks to the incentive that are provided to the, the use of, of data for advertisement uh, and what is the model of revenue and, and providing much more transparent information about uh, what information is motivated with, with, uh, with which purposes and make it more transparent. Uh, before, when you open any newspaper, you knew who was uh, the owner of the newspaper, what kind of political alignment it has. So we need to try to go back to that fundamental idea. And when people see digital uh, information, they are able to understand where it comes from and what is the values that are behind that. But not tell them this is true or false. This is about like, how to make more resilient the ecosystem. I think we have time for one more question from the audience. Any additional questions? Um, all right, in the absence of a question from the audience, I will ask, since we are here in Washington, DC, um, what is the thing that you hope the U.S. will do? What's the most positive thing that the U.S. can do to help you in your work? Uh, can I speak more to the uh, ecosystem of support in D.C., not exactly just the yes, government? Yes, please. Okay, uh, so, um, and, I, and I understand we have in the room people who are doing amazing work supporting, you know, uh, internews and other partners, you know, through, you know, uh, technical support, money and all that. You're in DC. Increasingly, the gap between the odd topics that excite you and the reality on the ground, that gap is getting wider. Uh, we have all these conversations about AI, you know, you know, fourth industrial revolution and things like that. In many of the countries where we work, those are great research topics, but they will not keep activists out of jail. I think that while we chase the sexy, we also need to make sure we support the necessary. Sexy is good, necessary, much better. Um, just following that same line, like to be more critical about how the, the ideas and projects that are funded to support uh, the digital environment or the freedom on the internet are connected with this fundamental question of the structural issues that the different societies confront in different regions, uh, inequality uh, and, and, and all the, uh, the issues related with transparency, democracy and, and all that it's necessary uh, and technology need to be regarded again as just another layer that need to be connected with these fundamental questions. 
and, and, and to work in a very much integrated way, making the question about what are the right intervention for technology. Technology is not always the solution for everything. Technology also can make worse things. So, uh, and that, it's not a, a general uh, evaluation, but it's a very contextual case-by-case -case evaluation. So, if you want to be more effective supporting the work that we do, help us on that to really uh, uh, have like more clear criteria uh, for evaluating when is the right intervention for technology and what type of technology uh, and what are the conditions that that technology should need to be implemented for uh, really uh, fulfill that good purpose that can have in mind uh, when uh, it's proposed. So this is all uh, reframe, uh, uh, sorry, it can be framed in the human rights impact assessment of any technology that is being promoted in developing countries. Well, I just feel bad demanding anything. There's a lot to do in DC already. Uh, if that can be fixed, a lot will be fixed anyway. <laughs> but um, stay optimistic. Uh, uh, as, as Benga said, um, Buzzwords are very nice, and that's where the VC money goes. Um, everything was blockchain a few days ago. Then it was coin offerings. Then it is the then it is of course AI will solve everything. But move fast and break things no longer works. <laughs> it never worked. But we really decided to believe in all that in that vision. Um, so don't believe in buzzwords because nobody else does other than VCs. Um, put the Put the money where the values are, not just where the new sexy tech is being built. Um, everybody wants to have a startup, everybody wants to have that life. Um, and this is from India where the best, th the thing which we do is make software and be engineers all the time. And, uh, but, but you can't leave humanity behind just because things have to move and build very, very fast. Um, don't believe the numbers, because the numbers are concocted by everybody. And as John said, um, the long-form media or media organizations, if they are not empowered and they're not allowed to exist, the, the attraction of the short form because the attention span is decreasing, um, the long-form media or the responsible journalists will also adapt to this new media. It doesn't mean that they don't need the funding or they don't need the support. Investigative journalism takes time. It's painful. Our old values, which the Western civilization or the Eastern civilizations have built over thousands of years, cannot just be abandoned because some of us who are uh, younger and live in Silicon Valley or Bangalore think that's how they are going to change in the world. So those value systems still work. We have not succeeded. UN is failing in its job in many other places, but at least the conversations are alive. So don't pull out support from where um, traditionally support has been, because that work is still going on. And to talk to the people, um, the, the, whether it is the platforms or whether it is the papers, the um, everything, uh, the, my first point was vocabulary has been co-opted. So what you hear may not be what you actually, what is actually happening on the ground. Everything which looks efficient and attractive is not necessarily translating to the same kind of freedoms what we want to all stand for. And you need ethics and you need rights and you need the conversation about rights and not just the conversation about ownership, which is what US's way usually has been um, whether it is the IP regime or how we talk about data these days, ownership is not the conversation we only need to have. We need to have ethics. And fund decentralized technologies. Can I mic drop at Google? Is that allowed? <laughs> I'm not sure I can build much more because those are all like critical points. Like I'm the biggest believer in the church of decentralization. It, it might be our only path out of this. Um, in terms of your specific question of what can DC, specifically as this weird city thing, uh, do in this world, 
for this. I, th I think underlining these two trends that are coming out of listening to what's going on at the local level and funding, uh, fixing those issues as opposed to pouring tons of funding into blockchain buzzword bingo. Um, with the caveat, two caveats. One, as important discussions around data localization for local, for like each government's empowerment economically happen, run that forward. How would that be used by, by the most oppressive government at the same time? Because the same tools are being used by authoritarian governments to have access to Facebook data, to Google data, to whatever centralized source data, um, where you can't play the, like that's not by jurisdiction uh, card as easily anymore. Um, so run those things forward. What would that look like? And that goes for private technology as well. Like when we you know, plug into the internet, do you want Apple to do that where you have to get a new plug installed every two years? Or do you want Google to do that where they'll just stop supporting that service? Or Facebook where they'll just mine your data uh, and then apologize for it later? Like when you have that plug in your head, that's going to be a, a very interesting platform decision. Um, <laughs> we. Um, and so I, we, there is a place for looking forward, I think. Like even though I am like the most pragmatic, please don't talk to me about blockchain because I'll yell at you person, uh, there is value in looking in these platforms and making sure that ethics and, and, and critical thought are being applied. Are we training AIs with diversity in mind? Are you going, is it going to be the experience of if you have darker skin, you don't get hand dried because they didn't program for that? Like this is building diversity at the beginning and building like ethics and strategic thought into these things. How will they be used? How can they be used negatively um, is important. Uh, don't pour a lot of funding in that. There's enough funding there, but pour thought into that and then pour funding into people on the ground to fix things. Well, I feel like that's some very important advice for all of us. I'd like to ask everyone to join me in thanking our panelists. <laughs> So thank you so much, Mika. And with that, it's 2.30. It's the witching hour. It's time for coffee. Uh, we really, we purposely built in a very extended coffee break. So we have a half an hour because we really wanted everyone to be able to talk to our partners who are here. And may I ask my panelists for the next panel to just stand up so everyone can see you? So Ashna and Babette and Emily and Carolina. So these are our panelists for the next panel. Uh, we're going to get some coffee. We're going to caffeinate. Uh, we're going to meet each other, and then these amazing panelists are going to sit down with me, and we're going to talk about what's actually working right now. Like, what are we doing on the ground that is making the situation better? What is going to keep us all from starting chain smoking tonight? Uh, and how can DC do a better job of supporting that? Like, how do we, in our capacity here, in this not just policy but operational town, how do we turn what we have into avenues for solutions? And how can we support that type of work? So with that, please, there's snacks and coffee. Please get up, introduce yourselves to each other. This is an amazing group of people. And we'll see you back here in about a half an hour.